All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you once again for joining us online on this virtual format. I know screens are always uh, less preferred than the in-person presentations. Um, and for us as well, we, we really would love to see all your faces again and hope to be able to do that soon. Hope to be hosting you in person soon. Um, support for these programs have been made possible by the Nancy Carol Draper Charitable Foundation, as well as Sage Creek Ranch. Um, these sponsors really do help make everything we do possible. And um, we're also super grateful to all of you out there who take the time out of your day to join us uh, via you know, this virtual format, whether that's in person, taking the time out of your day to come here and see the presentations or tuning in remotely. Um, we value your feedback and support uh, for these programs. So you know, feel free at any time, you can email Nathan and myself um, questions, comments, et cetera, about the program. We're all ears and we're interested to also hear what you would like to see. Um, we are recording these lectures uh, and uploading them to our Draper YouTube channel. So if you've missed any of our previous lectures or speakers, uh, you can find their talks there along with speakers from previous years. Uh, if you'd like to be added to our email list for upcoming lunchtime expedition and Draper After Dark talks, please send me an email at coreya at centerofthewest.org. The email will be in uh, an outro slide at the end of this presentation. Um, so we've also started including links from previous talks in uh, upcoming announcements in emails, so that's another good reason to sign up. Uh, we're broadcasting today's presentation over Zoom webinar um, while simultaneously broadcasting this via Facebook Live. Uh, feel free to submit your questions below using Zoom's chat or Q&A feature um, or on the Facebook Live. Um, we are both uh, monitoring, uh, Nathan and I are monitoring both of those, so we will relay your questions uh, to Dr. Reynolds uh, at the end of this presentation. Um, so today, we're going to hear from Dr. Bob Reynolds. Dr. Reynolds is a consulting geologist and longtime Denver resident. He earned his master's in applied earth sciences from Stanford University and his PhD from Dartmouth College. He has taught at the Center of Excellence in Geology at, if I get this right, Peshawar University in Pakistan at Dartmouth College and at the Col Colorado School of Mines where he is presently an adjunct faculty member and involved in teaching applied field methods in geothermal exploration. Bob continues to stay active as a research associate with the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. His dissertation re research on sedimentary rocks accumulated at the foot of the Himalayas led him to study rocks in the Denver Bay Denver Basin, detailing the uplift of the Front Range, which has led to a series of publications on the deformation history and stratigraphic control on groundwater distribution patterns. Bob first got his start in the Big Hearn Basin, crawling over anthills looking for fossil teeth as an intern with Princeton University. Later, he went on to teach field classes uh, with students from Dartmouth College how to make geologic maps, uh, and they were based out of Grable. He's the past president of the Friends of Dinosaur Ridge, and the Colorado Scientific Society has taught industry courses on Rift Valley and Western Interior Basin Strat 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 oh, man, I cannot say this word today, and taught water resource courses in China and South America. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Reynolds. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. So uh, I'm speaking to you guys uh, from Longmont, Colorado. Uh, again, I'll echo Corey and Nathan's sentiments that it'll be wonderful when we have a chance to speak in person. That time will come. Uh, but right now, uh, I'm happily ensconced down here in uh, Longmont, which is just north of Denver. And I'm going to be uh, describing the Bighorn Basin uh, in a variety of, of ways. And I wanted to just uh, start out my discussion by outlining the way I'm, I'm going to handle it. I think the, we're, we're going to... Uh, move into a, a Google Earth presentation here in a couple of minutes. And my thought is to spend about 15 minutes giving a sort of a general overview of, of the, the, the lay of the land, as it were, for the Bighorn Basin as seen from space. And Google Earth is a wonderful tool to do that. And then, uh, then we'll break uh, to a different segment of the program and, and talk about the geological evolution uh, in six simple chapters and it'll be describing how the Bighorn Basin came to, came to be and a little bit about the history as we see it by looking at the rocks that are so well exposed all around the basin. And then we're hoping to leave about 10 or 15 minutes at the end for any kind of questions and answers uh, and for the opportunity to maybe to expand on some points that we've made during the presentation. So 
Uh, Corey and Nathan are going to be monitoring the chat and uh, the Q&A panels. And uh, if anybody has a question, uh, if it's of immediate interest, they might pipe in and uh, it's a pretty informal group here. So we ought to be able to, uh, you know, have a sort of a conversation as if we're sitting around a campfire. Uh, let's, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to screen share. Uh, and uh, first of all, the, these programs are all sort of one-off presentations and it's a little bit clunky for, from my side to, to screen share. And I, I just say that because it'll require a few button pushings, but what we're going to do is uh, we're going to leave this front scene and we're going to go right over to uh, Google Earth and it'll take a moment or two to do this, uh, but I think it will happen. I think it's close to happening. Stand by. I've got to find Google Earth. It's right behind here. There. So I hope you're all seeing uh, the Bighorn Basin as seen from space. And if I hear no objections, I'll assume that's what you're seeing. Uh, and so uh, what we see here is, is a simple program which is available to all of us on our, on our computers. And it's a free download. And you can see, you know, you can back out so you see the whole planet. And then you can zoom in so you see the state of Wyoming. And then you can zoom in so you see the Bighorn Basin. And to be honest, you can keep on zooming and uh, it's a fantastic thing. We're looking at the east side of the basin here. We'll come back here in a few minutes, but I just wanted to show you that you can zoom all the way down into where you're looking at anthills. Uh, so, so you've got from anthills out to uh, the basin, out to the state of Wyoming and, and beyond. So a fantastic tool and relatively easy to use. And if you just pick it up, uh, download it, and just poke the buttons, you'll figure out how it works. When we look at the Bighorn Basin, it's very well defined. Uh, you can see, and I, I hope you can see my hand is sort of the cursor, but the Bighorn Basin is this uh, sort of oval shaped feature here uh, in North Central Wyoming. It's bounded on the west side by the Yellowstone area and the Absarica Mountains, the volcanic mountains, and then the Owl Creeks down at the south and the Bighorn Range proper on the east, uh, the Pryor Mountains up to the north. And it really defines an oval area that we call a basin. And the geologists use the word basin to refer to a, a coherent uh, set of rocks that are typically bounded by uh, logical barriers of one kind or another. So just as an example, we've got the Bighorn Basin. This would be the Wind River Basin down here, and the Powder River Basin would be over here to the east. So the term Bighorn Basin refers to this region here. And from space, you can quickly see uh, the first order of differences in the colors. The the greens and, and darker colors represent areas where there's vegetation. Uh, the clear, the brighter colors, the grays and, and almost orangey colors uh, represent relatively arid ground, sagebrush and uh, uh, relatively barren rock. Now, as we look at this basin, uh, I'm gonna tilt it a teensy bit. You can do that by <clears throat> pushing a couple of buttons, you figure it out. But if we're looking due north, the river that comes in is the Wind River from the south, <coughs> manages to change its names right about here from Wind River to Bighorn River. But the main thing about the first order views of the basin is that the landscape is controlled by water and people live where the water is. <coughs> the water is coming along the rivers. Uh, the land near the water, near the uh, river bottoms is fertile and irrigated and produces wonderful crops. The upland areas that are not irrigated are very different, dry, and uh, quite austere, but wonderful places to look for geological features, including fossils. So we're just gonna do a quick loop through the basin to get, your, get oriented. Uh, this is uh, the Wind River Canyon down here. As you come into the basin coming up from Shoshone towards Thermopolis, the red outcrops are the Triassic Chugwater Formation. You'll see them again and again. We'll talk about that maybe a little bit more. And I'll show a picture of it. But uh, we come to the town of Thermopolis, and uh, hot springs there are localized because there's water, groundwater coming down along the Alp Creek Mountains. It seeps down into the ground. It goes deep down underground and gets heated up. And then there's a fault and a fold right here at Thermopolis uh, that localizes a place for the water to come back up again. So the pretty simple story there, the, the water's heated up by the geothermal gradient and it comes up at the surface in the hot springs. Then you follow the streams to the north and we'll just continue our, uh, we'll go up along the uh, eastern margin of the basin here 
We come up near the town of Grable. Wonderful feature here uh, called the Sheep Mountain Anticline. And you can see the Bighorn River cuts right through the middle of the Sheep, of the, of the sheep Mountain. And uh, there's a railroad track and you can get right down in there and look at the features. It's held up by limestone. The uh, Bighorn, Mount, uh, the Bighorn Dolomite and the Madison limestone uh, hold up the axis of the uh, Sheep Mountain Anticline. And it's got wonderful uh, sedimentary rocks draped around it. And this is an area here where uh, Dartmouth College uh, has run field schools for many years uh, under the leadership of Gary Johnson. Uh, as we back out a teeny bit, uh, coming around the loop, uh, we're coming up, you've got the Bighorn Mountains on the right and the prior gap here where the Bighorn River flows out of the basin heading up into Montana. So the prior mountains there. Then coming over here to the left or to the west would be the, the Polecat Bench area. And I want to give a shout out to uh, my early days in the Bighorn Basin uh, in the town of Powell. I had a wonderful time working as, a, as an intern, really as a, just sort of a young high school student volunteer uh, with Princeton University. Uh, a fellow named Glenn Jepson, professor from Princeton University, uh, had been working with, in the uh, Bighorn Basin for many, many years. And uh, we were hosted by the Churchill family. Uh, they're located out here on the west side of town. And uh, Thelma Churchill was our host, hostess, and uh, her, her son Winston and his wife Beryl are uh, living there today. Their children and grandchildren are living there. So back in 1969, uh, I was living in Powell in the summer times, 69 and 70, and had a wonderful time, uh, wonderful hospitality, and a great opportunity to learn about the geology and paleontology of the basin. As we leave Polecat Bench, uh, we come across uh, we've got the Beartooth Mountains up here near the, the border. We've got somebody from Red Lodge listening in, so they're up there. Uh, Beartooths are there. Uh, we've got Hart Mountain here, and then we've got Rattlesnake Mountain, Spirit Mountain, and the reservoir, Buffalo Bill Reservoir, Shoshone River coming down through Cody. And then looping down around back to the south, coming down along the southwest side of the basin, uh, we'd come to the Grable River, and the town of Matitsi would be in there. And then you can see the north flank of the Owl Creeks here. Uh, and I want to stress that this tool uh, is, is a fantastic tool. I, I've told the people at Google that I, I have my life before Google Earth and my life after Google Earth. Uh, before Google Earth, we used to struggle to get air photographs and satellite images, and now it's uh, very routine. And I'm going to, a trick here, if we go down into the uh, Wind River Canyon, you can come right down. The detail is fantastic. You can see the river. You can see the debris flows coming in off burn scars on the uh, west side of the stream. You can see how it wiped out the railroad tracks there a few a couple of years ago. And, uh, and then there's a feature on, on Google Earth, which I can try to find here. You can drag this little guy and sponge him down on the road. And it takes you right down onto the road. And you have this astonishing ability to, to see the landscape around you. And of course that includes the geology. And so you can, you can travel around the world uh, from, your, from your living room. And it's just a, a fantastic, so here's that landslide we talked about a minute ago on the side. You can see the river in the foreground and the debris flow and landslide coming down from the side of the hill. So I think that uh, we're gonna use this background to the rest of the talk is gonna build on this, but I wanna, I'm gonna back out a teensy bit here and just sort of give the story as an overview, and then we can, we can come at it in various ways of detail. But starting from the, the, the Bighorn, if you drive through uh, from Shoshone heading north towards uh, Thermop, you've got the whole story laid out as a, as a series of, it's almost like a book. And um, I like to think of the book as being made up of chapters. We're going to describe those chapters here in a couple minutes. And uh, to simply think about it in an overview, the, the oldest rocks are at the bottom and the youngest rocks are at the top. So in the case of a basin like the Bighorn Basin, the old rocks are around the periphery, around the edges, and the young rocks are likely to be in the center. And that indeed is the case. And we're going to describe the rocks from the bottom up. We'll talk about the Precambrian, which is the old rocks down at the bottom. You can see them in the, in the uh, Wind River Canyon here. We'll see them in the Shoshone Canyon over here. 
in a few minutes. And of course, you can see them as you climb up onto the Bighorn Mountains themselves. So that's the fundamental basement rock, we call it. Then the overlying rocks are sedimentary. And you'll see the character of the sedimentary rocks, these uh, features that show layers very nicely. You can see the layers, in some cases, folded and deformed. And those layers are sedimentary rocks that fill the Bighorn Basin. And it's important to appreciate that the earliest sedimentary rocks didn't know the Bighorn Basin was going to be there. So the Bighorn Basin itself doesn't become manifest until the Rocky Mountains grow up. So prior to the Rocky Mountains, which in this case would be the Bighorns, uh, the Beartooths, and the Alcricks, so prior to the uplift of those mountain ranges, uh, there was really no Bighorn Basin. The, the geography was still there, but it was part of a much larger landscape uh, that we'll talk about in a couple minutes. So the Bighorn Basin, geologically speaking, is relatively young. And then the sediments that fill it range in age from, from uh, very old, 500 plus million years old at the edges, all the way up to zero in terms of the rivers that are flowing today carrying modern gravels. So in a sense, you've got a concentric system, the oldest at the edges and the youngest in the middle. And we're going to use that template as we go forward and describe the rock in a little bit more detail. So let me, uh, I'm going to stop sharing screen here just for a minute. So I think now I think you guys can see me. And I want to give a couple of more uh, shout outs to uh, uh, some of the resources that you have. Um, one of them is a beautiful book that was put together. I'm going to just wave it here so you can see it uh, called Ancient Wyoming. I hope you can, I hope it's the symmetry is right so that you can read it from left to right. But in any case, uh, this is a, a wonderful book. And it's filled with beautiful uh, paintings. And the book was put together by my friends Kirk Johnson and Will Clyde. And the paintings were done by my friend uh, Jan Riesen. So it's got a whole uh, abundance of uh, wonderful paintings showing ancient landscapes, including short faced bears and features and critters that used to live in a big one basin. So I highly encourage you to get it. I'm sure you can find it in the gift shop at the Draper, uh, at the Buffalo Bill Center. Uh, the other thing that's very important is a, a website, and I'm going to shout out now to something called geowyo.com, and that's, that's just G-E-O-W-Y-O.com. It's a website put together by uh, Mark Fisher and his colleagues uh, in Houston, uh, Ken and Debbie Steele, and uh, Mark is a Cody resident. He's a neighbor of many of yours, and uh, he and his colleagues uh, uh, worked for uh, Marathon, and uh, they've retired from Marathon and various other companies and have put together this wonderful website, geowyo.com, and it's full of resources. They've taken a lot of the images from the publications that have been produced over the years, and they've taken uh, satellite views and compiled it into a wonderful resource that I encourage you to use. It's a statewide resource, uh, but it has a lot of uh, information about the Bighorn Basin. So, Two resources there, the book, Ancient Wyoming, I encourage you to get that, and then GeoYO, I certainly encourage you to uh, hit that on the web. It's a, it's a wonderful resource. In addition, while we're talking about Cody neighbors, uh, Gretchen is there with you folks from uh, the BLM office in, in uh, Cody, and Gretchen's been a wonderful help to, to myself, providing me resources on the geology of the Big One Basin, and I'm sure she's a, a resource to everybody uh, in the community. So uh, now what I'd like to do is, uh, Again, switch, I'm gonna uh, share my screen. And uh, again, bear with me as this happens. It's a couple of clicks and I'm going to be putting a PowerPoint on the screen, a few more clicks. And uh, I hope now you're seeing uh, a tribute to Nancy Carol Draper. And uh, Nancy Carol Draper uh, is, was a, wonderful uh, resource to the people of Wyoming and the people of the Bighorn Basin. And she provided a tremendous sum of money to help establish the Draper Museum of Natural History uh, as part of the Buffalo Bill Center. And uh, so my hat is off to Nancy Carroll and her family. Uh, her, 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 she's a charitable foundation that's still operating. And uh, she was a, a wonderful uh, and very uh, generous donor to the community. This sign is one of the signs that's set up uh, on the foot of Hart Mountain. Uh, a wonderful series of signs out there illustrating the, the uh, geology and the environments associated with the, the trail that climbs up on the backside of Hart Mountain. So I encourage you to take a look at that sometime if you're out in the Hart Mountain area. 
But uh, again, thank you to Nancy, Carol Draper, uh, and we're all here. So now what I'm gonna do is uh, we're gonna go through uh, this uh, six chapter story. And what I'd like to, to do here is, is take it a little bit slowly and think about the, the significance of these things. And, and uh, this, this little slide with the six lines on it uh, parallels a comment I made a few minutes ago, but basically we're gonna start at the old and go up to the young. And the way I think about it is that the, the geology of the Bighorn Basin can be thought of as, as complicated. There's many different uh, layers of rock. Every rock has a name. And you'll find that the geologists are very eager to talk about the formations and the formation names and the boundaries between them. Uh, and that's all well and good, but it's a, it's a specialized work by people that, that know those names. And to be fair, we're still struggling with it. There's a couple, many of the units actually are still being studied today and whether the boundaries hold up through time or not, we're still not sure. But suffice it to say that uh, um, as you look at all these different named rocks, you can uh, simplify the story, and, and that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make it into six uh, chapters. I'm gonna put the layers together into, in the layers of a book into, into individual chapters, and we'll walk through them uh, in a sequence here from old to young. And, I'll, and I'm not gonna repeat this slide again, so you can, uh, I'll, I'll refer to these things as, as from chapter one through six, just to give you the chapter numbers. But basically, the, the Precambrian rock is at the bottom, then there's sedimentary rocks on top of that that represent the seas sort of coming and going from the west. And then there's a period of time where the seas really sat there in, uh, in the western interior of the United States. We call it the interior seaway. And then, the, then after that, the Rocky Mountains grow. So those mountains that I talked about, the, the Bighorns, the Priors, the Beartooths, and the um, Alcricks come up. The basin fills up with sediment, a very interesting sediment we'll talk about in a few more minutes. And then you have a period of volcanism. And I use the word tumescence here, sort of a fancy word, but, but you can think of it as bulging. So volcanism and bulging. We'll talk more about that in the manifestations of that in a few minutes. And then finally, uh, the region has been uplifted, lifted up into the air, literally, and uh, the rivers have cut down in. So there's been incising of rivers uh, in, as the final stage. But let's start at the beginning. And uh, this is a picture up in the Sunlight Basin. Many of you will have been there. You'll be familiar with this bridge across the, the uh, stream there. And the, the bedrock is, is beautifully exposed, as it is in many parts of the basin. But this is the Precambrian rock. And uh, many of you will have seen it up here in the Sunlight Basin. Here's another view that will be familiar to many of you. This is the view from the dam uh, in the Shoshone uh, Canyon up behind Cody. And you can see the, the rugged rock down here characterized by veins and dikes and, and uh, it's, we call it crystalline rock. It's granite. Some of it's uh, been sheared and it might be called gneiss. Uh, it's largely comprised of things like quartz and feldspar. And uh, it's got some mines in it from time to time that people will find veins. There might be uh, quartz veins, for example, might have gold in the Precambrian. Uh, it's been tunneled into, I think you can see a little tunnel there. And there's a tunnel that takes the water out of the reservoir over towards Cody. And uh, these Precambrian crystalline rocks uh, are metamorphic rocks, and they underlie the whole uh, Bighorn Basin. Now, it's important to appreciate that these uh, metamorphic rocks are overlain by sedimentary rocks, which you can actually see on the skyline there up ahead as we look out towards Cody from the uh, Buffalo Bill Reservoir. And I think the next picture shows that second layer a little bit better. And this is a view from the bottom of uh, the Wind River Canyon, the, the river's flowing um, up towards uh, the, the Bighorn Basin. And these gray cliffs, which are so prominent, are made up of limestone and dolomite, uh, which is a calcareous rock. Uh, they're, they're made of, uh, uh, if you look at them closely, you know, they're made of um, microscopic and, and visible marine organisms. And these are rocks that were deposited on the floor of a shallow sea or a series of shallow seas that represent the uh, uh, oceans that were present on the western side of North America. And, and our chapter two, which is, I call it the seas coming and going, but it represents this entire stack of rock that you see here on the skyline. And uh, this uh, pile of rock is, 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 is thousands of feet thick, and it represents a whole stack of ancient 
uh, coastlines and shallow water environments. If you think about it, the uh, Wyoming area and surrounding states were um, part of a large, uh, we call it the North American Craton, but it's the North American Shield and the ocean was to the west as it is today. So it was really the ancestral Pacific that we're talking about. And this was a, a vast ocean, but the waters lapped up and lapped off of the American Shield or the North American Shield. And Wyoming has this fantastic record of uh, the seas coming in and, and going out. And you can see that here in the, in the uh, Wind River Canyon. You can see it in the Shoshone Canyon. Uh, this is the view actually just uh, near the rodeo grounds in Cody. Many of you will have seen this view. You peer over into the river, you'll see the inclined sedimentary rocks. Uh, this, and again, in this case, this is the red beds we call the Chugwater Formation. Again, every rock has a name. And uh, these rocks are, are inclined, as are most of the older rocks in the uh, Bighorn Basin. Uh, and the reason they're inclined is because during the time of the uplift of the Rocky Mountains, uh, they were uh, deformed. So you'll see that the older rocks are commonly tilted. And there's a beautiful place here uh, in Cody where you can see the younger rocks are relatively flat lying. And we call this an angular unconformity. So that's an unconformity between two different packages of rock. And because there's an angular relation, uh, we call that an angular unconformity. So continuing our tour, <laughs> the next pile of rocks, uh, and I grabbed this off the internet courtesy of the University of Maryland, but Many of you will have seen views like this in the uh, basin. These are the black or dark shales uh, that are associated with the Cretaceous Interior Seaway, our third chapter. So the first chapter is the basement, the second chapter is the seas come in and go out, the, all that stack of layered sedimentary rocks, which includes the, the big limestones and the chug water. And then they're overlain by these big piles. There's thousands of feet of dark shale with some sandstones in it and also some bentonite deposits. And these are the uh, rocks that accumulate on the floor of what we call the Cretaceous Interior Seaway. And uh, it's Cretaceous in age, which is the younger of the age of dinosaurs. And we know the age because it's, uh, we can date the bentonites. The bentonites are actually volcanic ash deposits and we can date them uh, using radiometric dating techniques similar to carbon-14, but using different uh, parent and daughter isotopic uh, signal or measurements. And uh, basically we can date those uh, layers of volcanic ash, and then we can use those to uh, date the adjacent, the adjacent fossils. These seemingly monotonous uh, shale beds have occasional concretions, and uh, there's actually wonderful fossils to be found, often ammonites, and sometimes uh, marine critters that swam around eating the ammonites. So there's, a, there's quite a story about the uh, evolution of the of this uh, critters that lived in this interior seaway and of course this is a view in the bighorn basin but i could get a similar view in the denver basin where i live uh, we've got similar views out in utah and if those of you as you drive around the western united states you'll see the deposits of the interior seaway uh, well exposed in many different places and this is a very typical scene it's uh, pretty inhospitable for vegetation uh, it's a troubling feature for the uh, engineers because the uh, bentonites tend to shrink and swell according to moisture content. And so there's been a lot of uh, uh, engineering struggles to try to build infrastructure across the uh, interior seaway shales. Now, for our, our story, uh, chapter three being the interior seaway, uh, it, there's a fundamental break and a dramatic change uh, at the end of the interior seaway, and that's the, the growth of the Rocky Mountains. And in our view here, uh, this is a, a view of the uh, McCulloch Peaks, uh, courtesy of Wyoming Wildlife. And uh, many of you in the Cody area will have hiked up into these hills or been able to see them uh, out your uh, windows. And uh, these colorful rocks are quite a contrast to the underlying drab rocks from the uh, interior seaway. These rocks, uh, it's called, every rock has a name, these are called the Willwood Formation. Uh, they're Eocene in age. And uh, these rocks are uh, very beautifully exposed in the arid lands in the uh, uh, Bighorn Basin and their terrestrial deposits. This is a pretty good view because you can see um, there's uh, layers of uh, red and white and gray. 
And if I get my cursor here, there's some sandstone in there. If I can see, if you see that going around. The sandstones represent river deposits, small streams and rivers, and the mudstones represent soils, uh, alluvial plains on the sides of the rivers. And the reds are actually old soil horizons. We call them paleosols. And there's reds and purples, all kinds of fancy colors in there. And uh, these rocks are uh, Eocene in age, about 45 million years old. And the, uh, when the mountains were going up around the periphery of the basin, the axis of the basin was actually subsiding and accumulations of sediment accumulated about, uh, I've done the arithmetic on it, it's about two inches per human lifetime. So about two inches per hundred years, uh, the sediments accumulated in this basin. And that seems like it's pretty slow, but there's, there's like thousands and thousands of feet of sediment in there. And so that represents millions and millions of years of time steadily accumulating. And the magic thing about the Bighorn Basin is that these environments uh, next to the rivers, the soils, and the floodplains had a wonderful abundance of life. And the life is manifest as fossils, both as fossil plants, uh, studied by uh, Scott Wing and his colleagues, and by fossil animals, studied by Will Clyde and his colleagues, and Phil Gingrich and many others. And these fossils are really one of the great treasures of the Big Horn Basin. And uh, one of the fantastic things associated with the uh, fossil story, uh, and again, I date back to when I was a small high school student crawling over these rocks looking for little teeth. Uh, the story has been put together and is getting more and more exciting as people work on it. And there's an articulation between the stratigraphy or the layered sedimentary rocks and the contained fossils, which are both uh, animals and plants. And uh, there's a story that relates to change through time. And something that we've known for many years, the, the animals evolve through time. We can see that we find one kind of fossil low down, another kind of fossil high up. And there's a slow but sure change in the, in the character of the fossils. And as we've studied this in more, in more detail, we've come to appreciate that there's a fundamental boundary in the Bighorn Basin uh, representing by the rocks that are we call them Paleocene rocks, the dawn of the age of mammals, low down, overlain by the younger Eocene rocks, uh, which are uh, a middle tertiary or the, the part of the age of mammals. But the transition between the the uh, Paleocene and the Eocene, which are two subdivisions of time, is very very well marked in the Bighorn Basin and has been studied there perhaps better and more carefully than anywhere else in the world. So the, the geological record and the paleontological record of that transition from the Paleocene into the Eocene is extraordinarily well documented through the labor of many, many people uh, in the uh, Bighorn Basin. A few years ago, there was a coring program some of you might've heard about uh, and they cored that boundary. So it's been studied both in outcrop and in core. And the net understanding today is that approximately uh, 55 to to uh, 56 million years ago, there was a sudden change in Earth's circumstances and there was a dramatic warming event. And that dramatic warming event, we refer to it as the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. So to put some jargon out there, you'll hear people talk about the PETM, which is the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. And that is a sharp boundary. It's actually just under this picture here, but it represents a time in Earth's history where uh, ecosystems change dramatically, and we've documented that, and Scott Wing and his colleagues from the Smithsonian have documented that through studies of the flora, meaning the plants. And there's a clear evidence in the plants that the ecosystems of the southern United States suddenly moved up into Wyoming because it got warmer, so the ecosystems moved north. And the premise is that the uh, northern Arctic areas had the the ecosystems of the milder latitudes move up into the Arctic. And there was an opening up of uh, ecosystems that spanned from Eurasia into North America. And a whole series of animals migrated into North America, simply following their stomach. They, were, they could eat their way across in the Arctic environments because the landscapes became very uh, moderate and lush. And they came down into Wyoming all of a sudden, right at about 55 to 56 million years ago actually right at a point, and we can define the point. And that represents the arrival of the primates, 
uh, the arrival of the even-toed ungulates, the artiodactyls, and the odd-toed ungulates, the perissodactyls. And they all arrived in uh, North America at one fell swoop uh, at about 55 and a half million years ago. And that boundary is manifest in the, in the Bighorn Basin. And then the, the animals evolved into the horses and the camels and the primates that we know today. So in a sense, it was this amazing seeding of the North American landmass with these uh, species that came in, they migrated in. And that record is preserved in the uh, geology of the Bighorn Basin, one of the great treasures of the Bighorn Basin. And uh, following the, uh, the, it's an interesting story, following the, the mountain building of the Rocky Mountains and the filling of the basin, uh, there was a, a period of uh, volcanism. <laughs> and the volcanism, which gave us the Absarica Mountains, uh, in the uh, area around uh, uh, Cody and the Beartooths, it, it created something that's, uh, I'm giving you a couple of teaser slides here, but it created something highly unusual. And, and uh, these are actually views from the top of Hart Mountain. And the vol volcanism uh, that was associated with the Absarica Mountains, this is 40, 50 million years ago, uh, created some kind of a, I'm gonna use the word bulging, bulging or tumescence. Uh, and I, you'll hear me partly flailing a little bit because it's still relatively poorly explained and understood, but the net effect was that up by uh, the, the Beartooth Mountains and, and uh, Soldier Summit up there, uh, Dead Indian Pass, there was an uplift in a regional uh, bowing of the rocks and this giant landslide took place about 49 million years ago. And the rocks that you see here with the trees growing on them on the top of Hart Mountain are part of a mega landslide that slid out into the Bighorn Basin. And it's put debris over here in the skyline on the top of the uh, McCulloch Peaks. If you climb up to the top of the McCulloughs, you'll find big blocks of limestone out there that are part of this big landslide. So one of the most extraordinary features in the Bighorn Basin uh, is this giant landslide, a tremendous puzzle to early geologists because it was so confusing to have the ancient rocks, these are uh, Paleozoic limestones, on top of Eocene uh, mudstone. So the, the question, the whole thing was upside down from the point of view of the age of the rocks, and it created a lot of confusion until it was realized that it was some kind of a landslide. And then there's been lots and lots of discussion about, well, how fast did it move? And did it crush the poor camels underneath it uh, as it flowed down? And it probably moved pretty quickly. Uh, it was probably a pretty uh, amazing time to be around. And the mode of force, uh, again, relatively poorly understood, but we sort of wave our arms and talk about the, the intrusion of igneous material, uh, the destabilization of the margin of the basin, and the net effect being that this thing glided down into the basin, probably at a fairly good clip, meaning it, it did, didn't take years for it to happen. It probably happened, uh, you know, once it started moving, it probably came down in a matter of, some people might say hours, some people might say days, but in any case, it would have been an extraordinary uh, thing to, to witness. Uh, but following the, the, uh, the, the volcanism and, and sort of the, the end of the uh, mountain building episode, the region was planed off. And this is the, the view, uh, there's a little anteater for scale there, but this is a flat surface on top of the Beartooth Plateau that my sister is pointing to there. And uh, many of you will have seen these flat surfaces they're exposed on the top of the Beartooth. They're um, a subsummit peneplain on top of the uh, Bighorn Mountains. Uh, we have them here in the front range of the Rocky Mountains. And this actually extends out to the far east and uh, lines up with the Ogallala Aquifer out on the high plains. There's a huge period of stability uh, after the uh, Rocky Mountain buildup period. And uh, there was a time when the whole system was uh, planed off and stabilized. And it represents uh, a very uh, regional uh, flat surface that can be traced over very great distances. But in our chapter story, what I want to point out is that this flat surface has been uplifted uh, over this entire region. And I'm spanning from Montana down to, uh, to Texas. That region has been uplifted for reasons that aren't terribly well understood. Uh, and then associated with that uplift has been the incision of of the, of the river system. So the river systems have cut down in and uh, we now have uh, an incised landscape. And the terrain that we see today 
as we look at the Bighorn Basin, we look at the terraces of gravels, uh, we look at the uh, canyons and valleys, uh, that's all a rel relatively young feature in the last 10 to 12 million years. Uh, this material has been eroded out and carried down into uh, effectively the Gulf of Mexico. So the Mississippi Delta down in, in uh, near New Orleans has the material that used to be here in the Sunlight Basin, has the material that used to be in the Bighorn Basin. It's all gone downstream. And I think that I'll, I'll stop the screen share here. And uh, now I think you see me, uh, hopefully you see me speaking to you. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to circle the, the conversation here, then we'll, we'll be setting ourselves up for uh, questions and answers here in a moment. But let me just uh, review what we've talked about. Uh, the, the, the Bighorn Basin is a, um, a feature of the landscape of the Western United States. There's many basins, uh, but the basins were defined uh, during the Rocky Mountain uplift time. So I lived in the Denver Basin. Uh, the Bighorn Basin is neighbors to the uh, Wind River Basin and the, and the Powder River Basin. Uh, there's many other of these kinds of basins set up. But the geological story can really be simplified to say, well, there was a time uh, before the sedimentary rocks were here, the, the metamorphic rocks of the basement, crystalline rocks are there, very well visible in the deep canyons, overlain by the seas come in, the seas go out, uh, limestones, mudstones, all kinds of things, but all having a common characteristic of thickening towards the west, and also getting more marine towards the west. So you can walk on a rock unit in Wyoming, and as you go towards Utah and Idaho, you'll find that it gets uh, more and more marine or more ocean-like, because that's where the ocean was, as it is today, the Pacific. So the ancestral Pacific was there back in the Paleozoic, and those sedimentary rocks are all sort of wedge-shaped, and the wedge thickens out towards the west. Uh, then that unit is overlain by the interior seaway, for reasons not completely understood, uh, but the Western United States and extending up into Canada and all of Western North America was uh, very well, was covered by an ocean, uh, not a very deep ocean, but an ocean that's persisted for 30 or 40 million years uh, and accumulated a vast amount of mud. So the, the, the Cody Shale, we call the Thermopolis Shale, those dark shale units are characteristic of that period of time when there was an interior seaway that covered the whole region. The interior seaway went away uh, as the Rocky Mountains grew up. And as the Rocky Mountains grew up there, Dave Love, I think, described them as, as like pigs coming up from underneath blankets. And so the, the piggies were coming up and the sedimentary rocks were being stripped off from the tops of them. And that, of course, reveals the beautiful uh, deformed sedimentary rocks around the periphery of the, uh, of the Bighorn Basin and the surrounding basins. And important to appreciate that as the mountains were going up, the basin was sagging, and that gave us the opportunity to accumulate the thick accumulations of Paleocene and Eocene rocks that have the fossils in them. So that's a critical point there. And then following that, uh, after the, we call it the Laramide mountain building episode, but after the Laramide mountain building episode, as it was waning and towards its end, uh, this period of igneous activity took place, uh, forming the Absarica Mountains, uh, the rock units that you see down towards uh, Dubois and uh, between, your, between the Bighorn Basin and the uh, Tetons, for example. And during that time frame, the intrusion of something or the, the destabilization of something created the Hart Mountain uh, landslide, which is so prominent, of course, in the Cody area. And then following all of that, the entire region is uplifted, including where I am here in Colorado, and the rivers all headward, headward in size and erode. And you get this tremendous uh, ex exhumation of the landscape. It's unburied. And you get the revelation of the uh, geological features associated with that. And so in the Cody area, uh, you can see that it was somewhat episodic. And you'll recognize, if you drive around the town of Cody, you'll see different levels of terraces. If you look closely at the terraces, you'll see that there's gravels in them that are coming out of the Shoshone River. And uh, those terraces go out down towards uh, the the Montana border, and Polcat Bench, which is up behind uh, Powell, north of Powell, is the old floor of the Shoshone River. So the river used to be flowing up on the Polcat Bench. If you climb up on top of Polcat Bench, you'll be able to pick up gravel that came out of the Shoshone Canyon. So those, those terraces, uh, the oldest ones are the highest, and as the system is cut down bit by bit, 
uh, the youngest and youngest terraces down low, and the modern terrace today would be forming where the river is today. So that's, that would be the modern uh, stream floor. So I think now uh, what we could do is, uh, Corey, I, I'm not quite sure how we can handle this, but if you've picked up any questions uh, from the community, we can take some time to, to answer questions of whatever might have emerged of interest. And um, let's see if we've got some questions. And, and while people are thinking of questions, um, I want to reiterate, someone, someone's asked me, they say, well, what's the significance of the geology of the Bighorn Basin? And, you know, you can, if you look at the, uh, at the book, Ancient Wyoming's, I mean, there's all kinds of stories in here about the different geological features in the basin. And uh, there's lots of wonderful things, including, uh, you know, the development of the mountains, the development of the bear tooths, you know, the bear tooths, the tooth of the bear tooths are the Paleozoic limestones tilted up against the edge of the bear tooth plateau uh, behind Red Lodge. Uh, you can pick up lots of different things and you could say, well, the Heart Mountain thrust is exciting. That's very significant. The oil and gas deposits up in the Elk Basin, uh, Oregon Basin, that's pretty exciting. Uh, there might be bentonite deposits, pretty exciting. But I think that one of the great uh, heritages of the Bighorn Basin, one of the things that makes it highly unusual is this record of fossils. And I think the work that Glenn Jepson did back for Princeton University, and of course he was following the footsteps of others who had come from the beginnings of, of, uh, of our exploration of the West as scientists came into the West, they recognized the fossiliferous nature. Uh, many expeditions came to the Bighorn Basin looking for dinosaurs, uh, Sinclair, others, uh, and there was a uh, there still are a series of dinosaur quarries. Of course, Thermopolis, you can go and dig dinosaurs. So the dinosaur record is famous, but this record of the transition from the Paleocene into the Eocene, uh, the so-called thermal maximum, that's really one of the great uh, assets and one of the great heritages that's preserved in the Bighorn Basin and one that is of global significance. And, and I say that I, without much hesitation and, and my colleagues who are working on it uh, following the footsteps of all these people uh, have recognized that this transition in life uh, going from the Paleocene into the Eocene, this event that happened about 55 to, to uh, 55 and a half to 56 million years ago, and the time is getting increasingly precise. It, was, it happened within a few thousands of years, actually. Uh, this thermal maximum event represents a mysterious change in the Earth's atmosphere. We tell that from the uh, from the isotopes in the uh, carbon that are preserved in the rock record. And it appears that there was some kind of a methane outburst. Uh, we have speculated that possibly methane on the seafloor in the form of methane ice might have melted abruptly for some reason. It's not well understood. But in any case, it's, it, is, it is right now hypothesized that the Earth's atmosphere changed tremendously uh, at that instant during a, a short period of geologic time. And that is the closest analogy that we have in the rock record of what we're doing today. So the Anthropocene, we call it the Anthropocene today, this uh, earth that is modulated by man. The Anthropocene represents, of course, a big change in the character of the atmosphere associated with uh, the greenhouse effects and global change and global warming. And uh, the only, or the closest analogy that we can find for that in the geologic past is this uh, Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum that is so well documented in the Bighorn Basin? So the Bighorn Basin contains the rock record and the record of life tied to an episode of climatic change that is comparable to what's happening today. So we used to always say that the present is the key to the past, and there's a dogma in geology. We'd all go out to the beach and we'd look at the modern conditions. We say, well, this is going to be. The, uh, the, the way we understand the rock record. And now we're actually flipping that on its head and we're saying that the, the past is the key to the present. And we're, we're drawing on knowledge from the rock record in the Bighorn Basin to try to better understand the manifestations of climate change as we're seeing them today. Because today we're at the beginning of some kind of event that we don't know quite how it's going to proceed. And so as we seek guidance into what's happening and what's going to happen, we look to the rock record and try to find places where it's happened before 
so that we can use that as at least some kind of a guide to what might happen in the future. So really, the treasure of the Bighorn Basin lies in that, in the record preserved in the rocks of this Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. So, Corey, do we have any questions out there? Have you see, picked up anything? We do. You? We are having, a, we're, they're starting to come in. We have uh, three questions lined up. Uh, Jeff is asking how someone can access and explore a lot of the areas you mentioned. Um, one resource uh, is GeoWild for sure, um, but what other recommendations would you have if somebody wants to go out and see some of these areas in person for themselves? Yeah, so Jeff, one of the things that's, one of the magnificent things about Wyoming is that, is that, is that it's your land. I mean, that's, uh, it's it's our land. You know, a lot of Wyoming is is uh, public land, whether it's managed by the Bureau of Land Management or the National Parks uh, or the National Forest System. So, if you get a, a BLM land ownership map, which you can pick up from Gretchen over the BLM office, uh, it'll show uh, the areas of uh, of BLM land which are accessible or to the public. And I would encourage you to to just get out and wander and. Uh, if you're in Cody, uh, for example, the, the trail that goes up uh, to the top of Hart Mountain, it's, uh, you go up past the uh, internment camp, and uh, there's a little parking area there, and there's some wonderful signs. My hat's off to whoever built those signs. They're fantastic. And uh, you can walk up to the top of Hart Mountain and really see everything that we've been talking about. It's laid out like an open book in front of you for you to read. And again, the... Uh, the website uh, at goyo.com uh, will will introduce you to these places as well. That link to the website is in the chat. So if you aren't sure how to spell or anything else, just scroll through the chat and it has been posted up there. And we have another question. Dewey's asked, can you touch on the connectivity between Yellowstone Thermal Geology and the geothermal zone from Thermopolis, um, North Dakota, and up into southern Montana, where the yeah. hot springs are bound? Yeah, yeah, so, so, so uh, you know, humans have been interested in hot springs forever because it's so, so nice to go and, and wallow in them. So I hope you've all had a chance to wallow in them down at Thermop. And if, uh, up in uh, Yellowstone, you better be careful if you wallow because it's a little bit too hot in many places. But they're really very different. The, uh, the phenomenon at Yellowstone is, is the result of active uh, igneous activity or volcanic activity at depth. And we believe there's a magma chamber uh, underneath Yellowstone. In fact, we don't believe that we've measured it. And uh, lots of people have looked at uh, the, the character of the hot springs in the Yellowstone area, and they're tied directly to the thermal uh, emissions from below from this magma chamber. And some of them are, of course, hotter than others, uh, but there's faults, fractures, and fissures, and the rainwater is circulating down into the rock that's heated up by volcanic activity and coming up as geysers and as hot springs and mud pots. The Thermopolis situation is completely different. The Thermopolis situation, as I mentioned briefly before, you've got simply, it's raining on top of the Owl Creek Mountains, and the water drains down in, in the Madison limestone, largely. It drains down deep, deep, deep underground, and there's a geothermal gradient around the whole Earth. As you go down deep, it gets warmer because of radioactive decay, actually, largely. And so you've got this uh, heating. As the water goes down, it gets warmer and warmer, and then in the case of Thermopolis, that warm water hits a series of fractures and faults, and it actually is coming up along faults that we pretty well understand that go down into the, uh, in, into the Madison limestone underneath the town of Thermopolis. And the hot water is lighter than the cooler waters, and so it tends to rise, and it's rising up as a series of hot springs. We have a similar kind of effect in the Wind River Basin uh, on the Wind River Indian Reservation, there's the Washkie Hot Springs, very much the same situation. The, the hot water coming up from fractures and faults uh, off the flank of the, in that case, the Wind River Mountains. So two different kinds of phenomenon uh, producing warm water. Mary from Cody has a question. Um, looking at, uh, she was up on Hart Mountain recently and saw uh, some ridges running north and south. Um, and that they were upended and nearly vertical, uh, rising out of what looks to be at least some limestone. And wondering if that was part of the Rocky Mountain building or the Laramide orogeny. Um, do these sharp angles, do they proceed or follow the arrival of the Hart Mountain line? 
So, so when you're standing on top of Heart Mountain looking to the north, uh, there's a couple things. When, you're, when you look close in, so near sort of the apron, of, if you will, of Heart Mountain, the apron of Heart Mountain is going to be made up of pieces of Heart Mountain itself. So the close-in stuff, meaning within, you know, within a few miles of Heart Mountain, you've really got broken off slabs and fragments of the Heart Mountain uh, limestone blocks. And they can be tumbled and jagged and look like elongated ridges. The sedimentary rocks underneath them, though, are, are flat lying. And that's, that's one way to tell them apart. Uh, if you look into the further distance, of course, if you look out towards the, the north, northwest, and the west, you'll actually be looking up towards the edge of the, of the bear tooths. So there you'll be looking, if you're looking at a, this would be 10 and 15 and 20 miles away, looking up towards Clark's Fort Canyon and that country. Uh, there you're going to be seeing the flanks of the bear tooths. And that, those are the, the tilted rocks that are on the margin of the Bighorn Basin. And they were bowed up during the Laramide or the Rocky Mountain building. That's tilted them up like that. So two different things. One is the edge of the basin, and the other one is bits and pieces of stuff that have fallen off of the top of Heart Mountain. James has a question. Um, he's wondering if there are any formations in the Bighorn Basin like those at Medicine Rocks in Montana or Monument Rocks in Kansas. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not uh, familiar right now with Medicine Rocks uh, and Monument Rocks, so I'm, I'm, uh, I think if you could clarify I guess it's hard to relay questions back and forth here, but um, I'll have to say I don't, I don't know. Also, a, a contribution here from George. Uh, he mentions that the book, Ancient Wyoming, that is available in the Center Bookstore, um, and you can also get it online, it does contain a map indicating the location of the Bighorn Basin, of where to go and what to do. So another resource for folks. Um, Bob, I have a right. question for you. Uh, you got your start as a fossil collector in the anthills. Was there a particular uh, light bulb moment or experience during this time? You mentioned you were an intern uh, with Princeton. Um, so was there a particular experience or moment from the time that really just turned you on to pursuing a career in geology? Well, I, I've had a lot of people sort of ask that question and, and uh, I'll give you the analog from my, my uh, geophysics friends and students over at the School of Mines, they, they get asked the same question and, and they say, well, why are you a geophysicist? And what's nice about being a geophysicist? And uh, the students have thought about that a lot. And, and they say, well, they say they like physics and they like being outside. And geophysics is, is physics outside. So in my case, you know, I like science and I like being outside. So geology uh, is, a, is a way to do science outside. And then I'll tell you also, honestly, I like to travel. And so if you like to travel and you like to do science and you like to be outside, uh, as Gretchen will tell you guys, and, and, and as Mark uh, Fisher will tell you guys, there's no better way to do it than to, to be a geologist. So uh, we get to wander uh, around the world and uh, we get to use science to answer questions and to pose uh, hypotheses. And, and I'll say again, I really, I really want to make sure that, that the people who live in the Bighorn Basin, live in Cody, you know, really appreciate the importance and the significance of the, the rock record that is right there in, in your front yards. And uh, the things that we've learned from that rock record are, are astonishing. I mean, if, if when I was a small student, this was, I was, when I was a high school student as a, you know, working as a as an intern, we didn't have that word intern. I, I think I was a, a, a summer grunt whose whose eyes were close to the ground or something could find fossils. But but we were, uh, you know, we did we didn't know hardly anything. We we I mean we, we knew we were collecting Paleocene mammal fossils, and it was very interesting to try to identify them. But if what what we know today is orders of magnitude. If I if I I was teasing Corey the other day. I said, if, if I could go back to 1969 with some of the sketches that I have today and show them to this venerable Glenn Jepson, who was a venerable gentleman who, you know, he dressed, you know, very nicely in the field he wore to suit and tie. If I could show him my diagrams from today, it, it would just astonish him. And in the scheme of things, that's only, what, 50 years ago. So we've learned so much and we're learning so much more. And I I really think that it's a tribute to, uh, to, of course, the scientists, but also to the museums that host them. And uh, 
you know, I'm a research associate at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and I think the collaboration between museums, so the collaboration between the Denver Museum and the, the Draper Museum, uh, these are the sort of the, the avenues through which this uh, knowledge is, is, is shared and is pushed forward. And so uh, at the Denver Museum, we've got many volunteers that do a lot of the work. There's uh, 1,600 volunteers at the Denver Museum. Same thing at the Draper Museum. You guys are starting to have a volunteer program so citizen scientists can get involved in this. And I think that it's something that we should recognize that these questions about change through time, evolution of animals, evolution of landscapes through time, those are things that are, are of interest to all of us. You know, everybody wants to know, you know, where did we come from? Where are we going? Uh, you know, what is the meaning of this rock? And, and I think that the, the point that I'd like to maybe uh, end with here is that the, the geological framework is, is knowable. The, 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 books can, the book of rocks can be read. We can turn the pages one at a time and understand what they mean, what they signify. And the story they tell is wonderful. The story they tell is astonishing. And the story they tell has more and more details. The closer you look, the more you see. And so I think that we've got this opportunity to, to read the book more carefully and, and to share it with each other. And I'd like to think that this presentation is, is part of that effort. And I'm, I'm really very grateful to uh, the Draper for having given me the chance to, to join you guys and to, and to have this chat. And I look forward to, uh, to many more. Yeah, if you have time for a couple more questions, there are two more here. Sure. Um, another one is, uh, so the Northwest corner of Wyoming is one of the best places on earth uh, to study the history of earth. Um, so one of the questions is, what is the influence of glaciation in this region? Um, kind of like expanding this a little further, um, what impact has climate change had on the Bighorn Basin? Okay, well, that's a good question to, to answer by obs observation. And if you, if you were to drive up Clark's Fork Canyon, for example, just one place that you can go close, uh, when you get to the mouth of Clark's Fork Canyon, you, you've got this debris field big boulders, uh, the size of rhinoceros. So these rhinoceros size boulders. And if you look at it on Google Earth or look at it from the hillside, you'll be able to see there's a big moraine or a big apron of debris at the mouth of Clark's Fork Canyon. And it was quickly, it was, it was understood relatively early on that Clark's Fork Canyon had been the, the scene of a glacier uh, back in the Pleistocene. And in fact, that's figured in the book, uh, Ancient Wyoming. There's a painting done by Jan Vriesen showing uh, this glacier coming out of Clark's Fork Canyon. And we've studied the glacial history of the West, and a lot of it was done in the Wind River Mountains. So the, the, uh, uh, the, there's, there's several of the Rocky Mountain glacial episodes named after canyons in the, in the Wind River Mountains. But the records of, of uh, mountain glaciers are difficult to work on because one glacier erases the debris of the preceding one. So if you can think about it, you're only gonna see the most recent record. The earlier record will have been mashed out by the subsequent ice flow on top of it. So the people who were studying glaciation in the Rocky Mountains were frustrated by the fact that they had a very good record of the most recent uh, glacial episodes, which ended about 12,000 years ago. Uh, but then the one that was before that was about 130,000 years ago, harder to read. And before that, even harder to read. And, and it went sort of dim. What we discovered was if we went to other places like the seafloor, interestingly enough, the sedimentary record on the seafloor shows the glacial episodes, the, the temperature of the water changes, the biology of the ocean changes, and we can actually see the ice ages in the seafloor sediments. And it's shown us that there are on the order of 30 or 40 episodes of ice age uh, in the last 2.5 million years. So the Pleistocene Ice Ages started about two and a half million years ago in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, there's about 40 of them, give or take a few, where the ice came and the ice went. So it's very clear to us that the climate has changed dramatically uh, in the Ice Ages. And it's certainly clear to us that it's been episodic. And we've studied the episodicity of it. And, and a Serbian mathematician who we all revere a guy named Malankovic using pencil and paper before the time of computers figured out that there was a there are patterns in the way in which the earth orbits around the sun it has a 
the, the overall orbital pattern, which is its elliptical orbit, changes a little bit through time, and the Earth tilt changes a little bit through time, and then there's a wobble. So there's three components that change the amount of solar energy that comes into, let's say, the Northern Hemisphere through time. And Milankovitch figured out that the ice ages were tied to subtle changes in the amount of solar energy coming into the Northern Hemisphere. So we understand the ice ages now fairly well, and uh, they do represent episodes of climate change that are very dramatic and show up in the rock record. And you can see them at, at uh, Clark's Fork Canyon. But this present climate change that we're talking about today with the change in the atmosphere, uh, because we put the fossil carbon into the atmosphere, we've changed the composition of the atmosphere. We've dramatically changed the amount of carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere today to the point where we're doing a geophysical experiment on the earth and we all live on the earth. There's 7.3 or 7.4 billion people living on a planet on which we're conducting a geophysical experiment in which we're modifying the climate. So we don't know quite what that's going to do. We certainly don't know very much about potential feedback mechanisms as it gets warmer. You know, does more methane come out of melting tundra? Do the clathrate methane uh, deposits on the seafloor melt and come in the atmosphere? We don't know. So there's a, you know, we're, we're facing a great unknown as we look at the climate change today, but it is informed by the climate changes of the past. So this is kind of a perfect segue into Mary's question. She was asking about these methane seeps and how uh, they tell us, you know, they're kind of foreshadowing these events of the future, uh, these historical methane seeps. So kind of putting you on the spot in terms of if you were king, if you were a czar, well, was the term she used. Um, what is, um, what would you uh, tell the people today uh, in terms of the expectations of uh, behavior in responding to this um, the current situation we're in and where we're kind of heading down um, if something doesn't change. Okay, well, Mary, that's a very good question, maybe one that we can use to end our program here. I think that you're going to hear me always say the same thing. It's all going to be about education, uh, education. So it's, uh, the question is going to be uh, for us, um, how do we get information that we have uh, made available to the public, made available to the government, uh, in a fashion that is uh, understandable and not confrontational. So one of the great challenges that we have uh, in the United States today uh, and in the world as a whole is, is taking information that is understood by scientists and putting it into a format where it can be understood by policy makers such that to the extent that's practical, uh, steps can be taken to, to mitigate or to prepare for changes that are coming. And I'll give you, there's lots of different ways of looking at it. You could look at it from the standpoint of sea level rise, for example. So one of the obvious effects of warming is that ice is melting. And not only is ice melting, but uh, the ocean water is expanding. Not very much, but it's expanding as it gets warmer. And sea level is rising three millimeters a year. Well, three millimeters, that's not very much. That's, you know, a, a paperclip thickness a little bit more um, every year, maybe maybe two paperclip thicknesses every year. And you might say, well, that's not much to worry about, but I'm a geologist and I, I worry about that. That's a major deal. And uh, so how do we get the public, how do we get policymakers just to realize that sea level is rising and that that's a threat to our coastal communities? Uh, you know, you might say, well, that's trivial. You just let them watch it. But but it's, it's a pity if we have to just watch it because it's something that we understand as scientists and we could take steps to move people away from dangerous areas. Uh, so that, that's sea level. Look at another situation is agriculture and what's gonna happen to water, water supplies. You know, the Bighorn Basin, your agriculture is entirely dependent on uh, irrigation. And without irrigation, uh, it's tough to grow plants in in the Bighorn Basin. And in fact, the, in the North America, west of about 100, the 100th meridian, uh, the, the line of uh, longitude, about 100, uh, it's sort of Midwest. Once you get west of that line, you come into what had been called the Great American Desert. And if it keeps getting warmer, the, many of the computer models indicate that it's gonna get drier. 
And here in Colorado, we have a lot of studies that have shown that the Colorado River flow is going to diminish through time. So then the question again is, well, how do we, how do we make ourselves uh, sustainable in a time of diminishing water resources? And we don't have answers immediately, but we do have a lot of people working on it and they're looking at using water more efficiently. They're looking at using different kinds of crops, different kinds of irrigation technologies. So again, I think that science has answers. And one of the things that you can do, Mary, to answer the question is to look around the world. And uh, for example, I study water, water resources, and I've worked in the Middle East, in Egypt and uh, in, in Israel and Jordan in that area and looking at water and water resources. And, you know, they've got really severe water challenges over there, much more severe than we do here. And, and they've got tremendous technology uh, coming in terms of drip systems, uh, building greenhouses, putting uh, water into uh, the roots of, of plants, putting the fertilizer right into the water. They call, they call it fertigation because they're fertilizing and irrigating at the same time. And uh, they can grow tremendous crops in very arid circumstances. And uh, you guys are doing some of that work right now, the Shoshone Farms out on the uh, east side of Cody on the Powell Road. Uh, you can go out there, you'll visit, you'll see amazing uh, agriculture happening uh, under hoop houses. And uh, I think that, again, the, the, to, to really answer the question, I think it's, it's communicating our understanding uh, in a way that can be understood by people who are not scientists, who are not specialists. And museums have a big role to play. The Draper, you know, the Denver Museum, uh, these museums, the Smithsonian back in Washington, the American Museum in New York, these museums are the lights shining in the, in the you know, the, the dimness of, of uncertainty. And, and the museums carry knowledge and, and convey it. And uh, presentations like this and, and others will be ways in which we can bring information to people so they can recognize that there are solutions, but they will require uh, changes in the way we do things going forward. I mean, uh, there, unmuted. Bob, I want to <laughs> thank you uh, for taking the time out of your incredibly busy schedule um, to visit with us uh, and share your wealth of knowledge and experience. Um, it's really been a pleasure speaking with you. Um, but also a big thank you to our sponsors uh, supporting the Lunchtime Expedition Speaker Series, as well as for all of you for joining us virtually and taking time out of your day to visit with us. Um, you'll see an email link uh, down below there. Uh, if you want to be added to this, if you're streaming this from an online platform, you're not part of our distribution list, feel free to email me there and we will get your name added for upcoming presentations. Um, this presentation has been recorded um, and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you came in a little late and you missed something in the beginning, um, or if you'd like to revisit anything that Dr. Reynolds discussed, uh, you'll be able to find it there. So thank you all for tuning in. Um, and Dr. Reynolds, best of luck in all of your current and future endeavors. It's been a pleasure uh, being with you today. Great. Great. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody, very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Bye. Well, I'll see you soon. Uh, everybody will be back on August 12th for our next uh, virtual presentation. So be on the lookout for an email for that. Take care and hope you have a wonderful day.